Recall to life! Recall to life! Where are you now, though? Almost 18 years! The land is all over to be in dugout! Oh, long ago! You know you are recalled to life! I hope you care to live! And I shall wait to you! Will you come and see her? He can't suck! He can't speak! He doesn't know! He doesn't know her! He doesn't understand! Greece is free to a day! To be buried alive for 18 years! She's here! She's so I, I brought her! So soon? Just a minute! Oh, I expected her at five! Oh, hey, oh, I beg your pardon! Just like a banker! <clears throat> Recalled to life. Recalled to life. Miss Annette. Yes. And I, in your adopted country, I presume I can do no better than to address you as a young English lady. If you please, sir. Uh, Mr. Lorry. Mr. Lorry. Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Yes. Uh, I received a letter from the bank. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. But I am with Telson's Bank in London. You are, I know, a ward of Telson's. A letter respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw, so long dead. Buried. Uh, informing me of some discovery mm. which rendered it necessary that I should return to my... that I should go into Paris, and that, as I am an orphan and have no friends who could go with me, I should place myself, during the journey, under your protection. I would be more than happy to execute. Sir, thank you. <laughs> Miss Manette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to acquit myself of. In your reception, I uh, keep me no more than a speaking machine. Now, <clears throat> it is very difficult to begin. Uh, quite a stranger to me. Am, am I not? Oh, um, <clears throat> Dr. Manette. To my father. A gentleman of Beauvais, a scientific gentleman of great repute in Paris. Alexandre Manette, physician, native of Beauvais, afterwards resident in Paris. He married? 20 years ago, an English lady. Yes, I know. Ah, my wife, beloved of my heart, my fair young English wife. My poor dear mother. His affairs. Like the affairs of many other French gentlemen were entirely in Telson's hands. No business relationships, miss. Uh, there is no friendship even, nothing like sentiment. Uh, <clears throat> I spend my entire life turning an immense pecuniary bank. Mr. Lord, when my mother died, I was left an orphan. And I begin to think it was you who brought me to England. I'm almost sure it was you. <laughs> miss Bennett. <laughs> It was I. <laughs> Indeed, your mother, who, when your father disappeared. Disappeared? Well, disappeared, vanished, perhaps. Either word will do. It's a lot of material. The word is most material, Mr. Lorry. My father died before I knew him. <laughs> but if he had not died uh, when he did. You frighten me. But pray, pray control your agitation. I entreat you, tell me all. I will, I am going to. You can bear it. I can bear anything. Anything but the uncertainty you leave me in at this moment. <coughs> One evening in the third week in December in the year 1757, I was walking in the suburb of Saint Antoine in Paris. If Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had suddenly and silently disappeared, the suburb of Saint Antoine in Paris samples the people that had undergone a terrible grinding and regrinding in the mill, passed in and out of every doorway, shivered in every corner, looked out of every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment, but the wind shook. The children had ancient faces and great voices, and upon them and upon the grown ones was the sign, hunger. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses in the wretched clothing that hung upon poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and patch. Hunger stared down the sumptuous chimneys, started up from the filthy streets. On 
hunger was the inscription on the baker's shelves, written in every small loaf of its scanty stock bag. At the sausage shop, in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. I found myself about an hour's distance from my place of residence in the street of the school of medicine, when a carriage came up behind me, driven very fast. The cock people barely had time to disperse before the sweating horses.
If Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had suddenly and silently disappeared, if his enemies could exercise the privilege of consigning anyone to the oblivion of a prison for any length of time, then you may comprehend the motive and purpose of our journey today. And my mother? She implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any time he saw you, but all in vain. At last, she came to the determination of sparing her poor child the inheritance of any part of her agony by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead. I was told of a discovery, sir. Ah, <clears throat> yes. Uh, he has been... been found. He is alive. Greatly changed, there is no doubt. Still alive. He has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear, need <clears throat> Miss Manette! Oh, she doesn't notice a word. Um, oh, how very confusing. But how am I to contract business if I am confused? Um, hello? Say hello there. Oh, oh my precious, my bones! Why look at you all? Why don't you go fencing instead of standing there looking at me? I'm not so much to look at, am I? I'll let you know if you don't fence them for cold water. I will. Oh, I really think this must be a man. And you, in brown, couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Just look at her with her pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that thing a bank hunter? I, I, I hope she will do well now. No thanks to you in brown, oh. she does. I hope you may accompany Miss Manage to Charles. Oh, likely thing too. If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you think Providence would have cast my lot in an island? Now, <clears throat> this is uh, yes. Recalled to life. Uh, am I correct in taking this to the wine shop of Monsieur de Parge? Our business is with Monsieur de Parge. He is expecting us. You work hard, madam. Yes. Mm. What is it you make? Oh, many things. For instance? Oh, for instance? Shrouds! <coughs> ah, uh, recalled to life. Recalled to life. This is our man. Who is called, sir? Come. Throw your line. The old typical fellow begins slowly. Is he alone? Alone? God help him. Who should be with him? <laughs> is he always alone? Yeah. He is greatly changed. Changed? God to take their souls to everlasting hell. I'm afraid of it. Of, of it? Of what? I mean, of him. Of my father. Good day. Good day. Still hard at work, I see. Yes, I am working. You have a visitor, you see? What did you say? You have a visitor. Come. This is Monsieur. He knows a well-made shoe when he sees one. 
Show that shoe you're working at. Won't you tell this monsieur what kind of shoe it is and the maker's name? I forget what it was. You asked me, what did you say? Won't you describe the type of shoe for monsieur's information? It is a lady's shoe. It's a young lady's walking shoe. It's in the present mode. I never saw the mode. I felt the pattern in my hand. And the maker's name? Did you ask my name? Assuredly I did. 105 North Tower. Is that all? 105 North Tower. <laughs> you are not a shoemaker by trade? I am not a shoemaker by trade. I, I, I was not a shoemaker by trade. I learned it. Here, I, I taught myself, I asked, I asked permission to teach myself and I got it over time and, and with great difficulty and I made shoes ever since. Dr. Manette, <coughs> do you remember nothing of me? Have you recognised him, monsieur? Yes. Definitely, for, a, for a one moment, single moment, I have unquestionably seen the face I once knew so well. <gasps> what, what is this? You're not the jailer's daughter? No. What are you? The same. The, the, the same hair. How could this be? She laid her head on my shoulder that evening. She had a fear of me going out. How it was this? Was that you? Oh, I entreat you, the good gentlemen, do not come nearer, do not speak, do not move. Say, voice. Oh. How can this be? You're, you're, you're too young. See what the prisoner is. These are not the hands she knew. This is not the voice that she ever heard. No. No. Tell me, what is your name, my gentle lady? Sir, at another time you shall know my name, and who my mother was, and who my father, and how I never knew their hard, hard history. If you hear in my voice, I don't know that it is so, but I hope it is. If you hear in my voice any resemblance to a voice that was once sweet to the music of your ears, sweet for it. If I tell you that your agony is over and that I have come to take you from it, it causes you to think of your useful life laid west and of your native France so wicked to you. Sweet for it, sweet for it. And if, when I shall tell you my name, you learn that I have to kneel to my honoured father and implore his pardon for never having striven day and night for his sweet sake, sweet for it, sweet for it. Oh, thank God! Good gentlemen, say I feel his tears upon my face and his soft strength against my heart. Oh, see! Thank God for this! Thank God! Is, is he fit enough to travel? Born fit to remain in this city. You remember this place, my father? You remember coming up here? What did you say? Remember? No, I, I, I don't remember. It was so long ago. Within two hours, Mr. Lorry and Monsieur Defarge had made all ready for the journey and had brought with them, besides travelling cloaks and wraps, bread and meat. Wine. Hot coffee. On reaching the courtyard, they heard him mutter, 105 North Tower. And as he looked about him, it evidently was for the strong fortress walls that long encompassed him. But there was no crowd about the door. Only one soul was to be seen, and that was Madame Defarge, who leaned against the doorpost, knitting. 
his whip and as they clattered away under a, under a feebler and feebler grove of overswinging lamps out under the great grove of stars. Beneath that arch of unmoved and eternal lights, some so remote from this little earth and the lonely terrace is doubtful whether no rays have even yet discovered us as a point in space where anything is suffered and done. Passing 
between France and England on secret business of which he can give no honest account. It is a happy coincidence, but Providence has put it into the heart of a shining citizen, formerly the prisoner's friend, to ferret out the nature of a prisoner's schemes and, struck with horror, to disclose them to His Majesty's Chief Secretary of State. I call Mr. John Barsad. You are Mr. John Barsad, a gentleman? Yes, and patriot all my life. Are you acquainted with the prisoner for these five years? Do you know him well? Very well. How well? Day and night, hardly out of his company. <laughs> very well, very well. And do you recognize these lists? Very much so. Have you seen these lists before? Indeed. Lists of His Majesty's forces of their disposition and preparation by land and sea. Where have you seen these lists? In the prisoner's pockets. And? In the prisoner's vest. And? In the prisoner's hand when he spoke to gentlemen. French gentlemen. Both at Calais and Beloit. Where was it? Many times. Of both the first time. Five years ago, within a few weeks. Within a few weeks of the first action fought between British troops and the Americans. No further questions. <laughs> Mr. Snyder. Have you ever been a spy yourself? No, I scorn the base insinuation. What do you live on? Property. Where is it? I can't recall precisely where it is. What is it? Well, that's no business of anybody. Inherited? Yes. From whom? Relations. Distant? Distant. Very distant. <laughs> Very distant. Have you been in prison yourself? No, and no again. Debtor's prison? Well, I never. Yes. How often? Two or three times. Not five or six times. Uh, Perhaps. Uh, In your profession? I am a gentleman. A gentleman? Ever been kicked? No. Frequently? Well. Ever been kicked downstairs? Certainly not. No. Once got kicked at the top of the staircase, fell downstairs quite to my own accord. <laughs> <laughs> Ever borrowed money? Of the prisoner? Yes. Ever paid? No. Is in fact your relationship with the prisoner a trivial one? Forced upon the prisoner in packets, <laughs> inns, and coaches. No. Are you certain you saw the prisoner with an English list? Yes. Had no prior knowledge of these lists? No. Did not procure these lists for your own purposes? No. Do you hope to get anything by this evidence? No. Are you not in the regular pay and employment of the government? To lay track? Certainly not. Do you swear it? No. And that is yes. <laughs> oh, Miss Lucy Manette. Who's this? A witness. Who's the gent? Her father. Who's called up? The prosecution. Oh, against the prisoner. Against the prisoner. Miss Manette. You have seen the prisoner before? Yes. When? I was returning from France five years ago. At Calais, the prisoner came on board. At what hour had he come on board? At a little after midnight. In the dead of night? Oh. Had he come on board alone? No. How many were with him? Two French gentlemen. Oh. Had any papers been handed about among them similar to these lists? Some papers have been handed about among them. But like these in shape and size? Possibly, but the light was very dim. Uh, so it's now, oh. to the prisoner's conversation, Miss Manette. The prisoner was as open in his confidence with me as he was kind <coughs> and good and useful to my father. I hope I may not repay him by doing him any harm today. Please, 
Congratulations! Our relief and joy at this conclusion. My grateful thanks to all. You may hardly comprehend my anxiety that the evidence which I was given. <laughs> oh, welcome! A holy welcome, Alpha. <laughs> there are no words to express. No. It. Well, it was a greater undertaking, and undertaken well. <laughs> I am proud to have brought you to justice, Mr. Darnay. The prosecution's case was infamous, grossly infamous, but nonetheless likely to succeed. On that account, you have laid me under an obligation to you for life. Ah, Darnay, I have done the best that I can do, and I hope my best is as good as the next man. Oh, much better. Oh, really? You think so? <laughs> well, of course, you were there the whole time. You should know. <laughs> Mr. Darnay. Uh, I hardly seem yet to belong to this world again. Mr. Dunn, my father is anxious to thank you for your kindness to him five years ago. You are much recovered, sir, for which we should all give thanks. In the days when all things are to be answered for, you are my witness. I must get back to work. I've been idle too long. Young ladies walk in the Father, father. Forgive me. Forgive me, it's such a day. Uh, I feel a little faint. Shall we go home? Yes, I, I, I think that would be best. Uh, just, uh, Hi. Uh, congratulations. Good night, Mr. Darnley. I hope we may see you again. I hope I most fervently share. Mr. Strunk, will you see us to a carriage? We are all in need of sleep. Well, you must speak to yourself, Mr. Nett. Speak to yourself. I have work to do tonight. Memory, tonight at 10. I shall see you at 10, Memory. Well, goodbye, Mr. Darnley. Goodbye. Come along now. Do you feel that you belong to this terrestrial scheme again, Mr. Darnley? I am still confused regarding time and place. But I am so mended as to feel that. There must be an immense satisfaction. As to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget I even belong to it. There's no good in it for me. Except a wine like this. Nor I for it. So, not much alike in that particular. Or any particular, you and I. What do you call a health, Mr. Dyer? Why don't you give a toast? What health? What toast? My head's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be. It must be. That's right, sir. Uh, Miss Manette. Miss Manette, then. It's a fair young lady to be pitied for and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion? I cannot answer your question. I know I am much indebted to you for your part in the happy outcome of. I mean, the one to do thanks for merit. There's nothing to do in the first place. I don't know why I did it in the second. Darnay, let me ask you a question. Will you? And a small return for your good offices. Do you think I particularly like you? Really, Mr. Carlton, I have not asked myself the question. Well, ask yourself the question now. You. You have acted as if you do. But I don't think you do. I don't think I do. You have a very good opinion of your understanding. Nevertheless, there is nothing in that, I hope, to prevent our parting without ill blood. Not only me and I. Then good night, Mr. Carton. The last word, Mr. Darnay. You think I'm drunk? I think you have been drinking. Uh, you know I've been drinking. Since I must say so, I know it. And you should likewise know why. I am a disappointed judge, sir. I care for no man on earth. And no man on earth cares for me. That is much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. You can say, Mr. Darnley. Maybe not. Good night, then, Mr. Darnley. Good night. Don't let your sober face so late to you, however. You don't know what life may come to. Do you particularly like the man? What should you particularly like the man who resembles you? 
There's nothing in you to like, you know that. Oh, confound, what a change you've made in yourself. A good reason to take it to a man that shows you what you've fallen away from. What you might have been. Make places with him. To be looked at by those beautiful brown eyes as he was. As agitated as that bad old face as he was. The devil, come on. Have an out in plain words. You hate the fellow! When he stepped out of the house, the air was cold and sad. The dull sky overcast, the river dark and dim. Waste forces within him and the deserts all around. This man stood still for a moment and saw, lying in the wilderness before him, a mirage of honourable ambition, self-denial and perseverance. Fair city of this wisdom. There were airy galleries for the loves and graces looked upon him. Gardens for the fruits of life unripening, 
waters of hope sparkled in his sight. A moment, and it was gone. Climbing into a tall chamber in a well of houses, he threw himself down in his clothes on a neglected bed, and the pillow was wet and wasted tears. Uh, 
He shall be registered tomorrow. The quiet street lodgings of Dr. Manette and his daughter Lucy were on a quiet street corner not far from Soho Square. There were few houses then north of the Oxford Road, and forest trees flourished and wild flowers grew, and the hawthorn blossomed in the now vanquished fields. As a consequence, country air circulated in Soho in vigorous freedom, instead of languishing into the parish like straight horses without a settlement. Miss Ross. A pleasant sight, albeit wild and red and grim. Miss Frost, who had escorted her young child Lucy to meet Mr. Lorry at Dover almost six years earlier. Miss Frost took charge of the little household. And always acquitted herself marvellously. Her dinners of a modest variety were well cooked and well served. She ravaged so in search of impoverished French, who for a shilling would impart culinary mistress to her. Mr. Lorry was a frequent visitor. How did you? I'm pretty well, I thank you. How are you? Nothing to talk about. Indeed. Well, indeed. Uh, Frost, I want to ask you a question. I am very much put out about my ladybird. Oh, for gracious sake, stop saying indeed, or you're busy with today. <laughs> really, then? Really bad enough, but better. Yes, I am very much put out. May I ask the cause? I don't want dozens of people who are not at all worthy of the pet to come here looking after her. Well, do dozens come for that purpose? Hundreds. Dear me. I was with you on the road. Lucy. Just two minutes. Uh, Lucy. I have lived with the darling, and she has paid me for it. She certainly should not have done since she was ten years old. And it's really very hard. Crowds and multitudes of people who are not at all worthy of the pet turning up to take Lady Bird's affections away from me. When you began it... I began it, Ross. Well, didn't you? Who brought her father to life? Not that I have any fault to find with Dr. Manette, except he's not worthy of such a daughter. It is of the doctor I wish to speak. Oh, he ho hum. <laughs> <laughs> you must not say such things, even in jest. Indeed, Charles Darnie, you shall not leave us tomorrow. I forbid it. I shall be in France for only a month. Then it will be in a month's time that I shall next pass an hour to untroubled by anxieties for your safety. <laughs> you see, I am a villain. The prosecution's <laughs> case was fair. <laughs> Mr. Carton, you said you wished to speak to me. I did, yes. You've eaten nothing, Mr. Carton. I fear you're not well. No, Mr. Nettle, I find it not conducive to help. What has been expected of such profligates? Perhaps. Perhaps you should try to live a better life. No, it's a shame. Then why not change it? Uh, Lizzie, 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 we are losing ground with Mr. Darnay. Uh, you alone can dissuade him. Uh, I think not. You must fight on without me, at least for a few months. I break down with the knowledge of what I want to say to you. Can you hear me? If it will do you any good, Mr. Carton, it would make me very glad. Do not be afraid to hear me. Do not shrink from anything I say. I am like one who died young. All my life, I might have been. No, Mr. Carter, I am sure the best part of it might still be. You just have so much more. Say I deserve you, Mr. Carter. Say I'm worthy of you. Although I know better. Although in the mystery of my own wretched heart, I know better. <coughs> Never forget it. Mr. Carter, I... I know you can have no tenderness for me. I ask you, Mum. We can thank you that it cannot be. It has been possible for you to return the love of the man you see before you, who had been conscious in spite of his happiness, he would like to disgrace you and put you down with him. Can I not repay you this confidence by turning it to some good account of yourself? <laughs> none, Miss Manette. To none. Can I not save you, Mr. Carter? I wish you to know. You have been the last dream of my soul. The sight of you and your father. Not this home, but such a home by you, stirred old shadows in me. I thought it died out long ago. 
Since I've known you, I've been troubled by remorse. A remorse that I thought would never trouble me again. I've had ideas of striving afresh and beginning anew. Shaking off the sloth and the sensuality. Fighting out an abandoned fight. It's a dream. It's all a dream. It in nothing. It leaves the sleep for where he lay. But I wish you to know that you inspired it. Have I no power for good with you at all? No, Miss Knight. The utmost good which I'm capable of, I can't be able to realize. Let me carry you through the rest of my resurrected life with remembrance. I opened my heart to you, and there was something left in me which was at least before and with you. Which I entreat you to believe with all my heart was capable of better things. I entreat you to believe it no more, Miss Knight. The utmost good of which I'm capable of, I can't be able to realize, and I have proved myself. Mr. Carter, the secret is yours, not mine, and I promise to respect it. Thank you. God bless you. You have a no misapprehension of me ever resuming this conversation by so much as passing away. But with myself, I should always be towards you what I am now. But outwardly, I should be able to appeal to you soon. I believe. I believe. You do. For any dear to you, I would do anything. I would embrace any sacrifice. The custard will be growing bold if we do not end all this conversing in corners and sit down at the table to eat it. This is an improper retirement. <clears throat> so we leave your visit time. The visitor between you and you is an impassable space. Miss Carson. Miss Cross. It is doubly and trebly hard for a person when they have performed their appointed task, then they ache to do their business in a foreign pastry to find other people scurrying up and down like ants on a doorstep. My dear Miss Frost. Your dear Miss No. I have a question for you. And I shall have the fit of the jerk shall keep me in my room for a week. We are both people of business. People of stuff nonsense. I want to ask, and you alone I can trust you. Does the doctor never refer to the shoemaking time? Never. And yet he keeps the tools and bench by him at all times? Well. Well, do you believe he thinks it much? I do. Do you imagine? <laughs> never imagine anything. Have no imagination at all. Well, I stand corrected. Uh, do you suppose you go so far as to suppose sometimes? Then, do you suppose Dr. Manette has any theory of his own preserved to all these years as to the cause of his oppression, perhaps even as to the name of his oppressor? I don't suppose anything about it but what Lady Bird tells me. And that is? That she thinks of him. Tis strange she should never touch upon the question. Well, to the best of my understanding, He's afraid of the whole subject. Afraid? He's plain enough. His loss of himself grew out of it. Not knowing how he lost himself or how he recovered himself, he can never be certain of not losing himself again. True. And fearful to reflect upon. Sometimes he gets up in the dead of night and can be heard walking up and down. Walking up and down in his room. Lady Bird has learned to know then that it's his mind walking up and down, walking up and down in his own rhythm. Here he comes. We shall continue this conversation in the kitchen. Uh, um, show me your custard, Cross. Uh, shall I go on, sir? Yes, go on. Dear Dr. Manette, you must believe it. I love your daughter dearly, devotedly, uh, disinterestedly. If ever there were love in the world, I love her. You have loved yourself, and your old love speak for me. No. I ask your pardon. I, I, I do not doubt your loving, Lucy. You may be sure of that. Have you spoken with her of marriage? There is a tenderness so unusual and so touching between you and Miss Burnett that I have felt do even now feel 
to bring my love between you is to touch your history with something not quite so good as itself. But I love her. Heaven is my witness that I love her. I believe you. I look only to share in your life and home, not to come between you and Lucy, but to bind her closer to you, if such a thing may be. You speak feelingly and honestly. I thank you for that. If there were any apprehensions against the man she really loved, they would all be obliterated for her sake. She's everything to me, more to me than suffering, more to me than wrong, more to me than... So this time, Charles Darnie, I will not stand in your way. Oh, Dr. Lynette, I thank you. Your confidence in me ought to be returned with full confidence on my part. My present name, though but slightly changed, is not my own. I wish to tell you what it is and why I am in England. Stop! I wish it, that I may better deserve your confidence. Stop! Tell me when I ask you, not now. If your suit should prosper, Lucy should love you. Tell me on the morning of your wedding. Monsieur the Marquis was driven on from the suburb of Saint Antoine. A blush upon the noble countenance of Monsieur the Marquis was no impeachment upon his high breeding. It was occasioned by an external circumstance beyond his control. The setting sun will die out directly. At last the carriage arrived at a poor village near the chateau of Monsieur the Marquis and stopped. You there, come here. What did you look at so fixedly? Uh, Monseigneur, I looked at the man. What man, pig? Pardon? Uh, Who? Oh, Monseigneur, I looked at the man. Oh, the devil take these idiots. Who was he? Oh, for all my days, I have never seen him. What was he like? Oh, he was whiter than the villa, all covered in dust. White as a spectre, tall as a spectre. Go on! The carriage broke into a brisk trot, and Monseigneur, escorted by the Fiori, rapidly diminished the league or two of distance that remained between him and his dinner. At last, the carriage stopped. Up the broad flight of narrow steps, Monsieur the Marquis proceeded. Wait at the great door of his chateau. When have you arrived? I know, Monseigneur. You will arrive tonight. I'll leave a table where it is. After a quarter of an hour, Monseigneur was ready. <laughs> Sat down to a light supper. Suddenly, who was that? I thought I heard something. Monsignor? Outside the window. Well, Monsignor, it is nothing. Only the night and the trees are there. Good. Good. He was halfway through his dinner when he heard the sound of a visitor arriving. It is your nephew, Monsignor. Who had been a few leagues behind Monsignor on the road diminish the distance rapidly. And had heard at the posting houses that Monseigneur was before him. Was told that supper awaited him. Was prayed to come to him. He was known in England as Miss Charles Darnay. The bell? My dear old friend! Oh, good master <laughs> Charles! I have hardly oh, dared to I should Thank see. you, the bell, out of the old. Ever the friend of summons, Monsieur Charles. I've answered your summons. I've come back, sir. Eventually. But still pursuing the object that carried me away. 
It led me into great and unexpected peril, but it is a sacred object, and I hope if it had carried me to death, it would have sustained me. Not to death, it is not necessary to say it. To death. I doubt, sir, if it had carried me to the utmost brink of death, you would have cared to have stopped me there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Indeed, I believe it once to be your bad fortune and my good fortune that has kept me out of prison in France. Dare I ask you to explain? I believe, were you not in disgrace with the court, and had not been overshadowed by that cloud for years past, that a let de cachet would have sent me to some fortress indefinitely? It is possible. For I am, as you say, at a, a disadvantage. These little instruments of grace, at least, Gentle age, the power and honour of families are now only to be obtained by interest and importunity. We have lost many privileges, and the assertion of our station in this day should cause us real inconvenience. All very bad, very bad. We have so asserted our station that I believe our name to be more detested than any name in France. Oh, let us hope so. Detestation of the high is the involuntary homage of the low. There is not a face I can look at in all the country round about me that looks on you with any deference but the dark deference of fear and slavery. A compliment to the grandeur of family, a merited by the manner in which the family sustains its grandeur. A manner which required the injure every human creature that came between us and our pleasure. And so I am left to execute the last request of my dear mother's lips, and to obey the last look of her eyes, which implored me to have mercy, and to redress. Better be a rational creature, and accept a natural destiny. But you are lost, Monsieur Charles, I see. The inheritance and title are lost to me. I renounce them. If they fell to me from you, I would abandon them, and live otherwise and elsewhere. Uh, what is this property but a crumbling tower of waste, mismanagement, hunger, oppression, and suffering? You? And I forgive my curiosity, but how do you, under your new philosophy, graciously intend to live? I shall work. In England, for example? Yes. Mm. They say, this boastful English, it is a refuge of many. You know a compatriot who has taken refuge there? A dog. Yes. With a daughter. Yes. Yes. A doctor with a daughter. Yes. And so commences the new philosophy. You are fatigued. Good night. Oh, cool. What Good night. night. I look forward to the pleasure of seeing you again in the Good repose. Cabal! Yes, Monseigneur! Light Monsieur, my nephew, to his chamber there. Yes, Monseigneur. And burn Monsieur, my nephew, in his place. <coughs> Oh, 
Yes. I must fulfill my promise to you and tell you the whole truth of my history. Yes. So that nothing stands between us. And he is marriage day. Charles Darnay told the good doctor of Beauvais where he had been born and why he was in England, the nature of his lifelong quest and the obligations that bound him to it. But most importantly, he told the doctor his name and who his father had been. And who his uncle was. His grace, the late and greatly unlamented Marquis Saint Avram. Take her, Charles. She is yours. <laughs> Don't cry. I'm not crying. You are. I, Miss Bruce. Well, you were just now. I saw you do it. Oh, dear me, dear me. Perhaps I want. This is an occasion that makes a man reflect on all he has lost. <laughs> to think that there might have been Mrs. Lorry any time these past 50 years almost. Not at all. Do you think there might never have been a Mrs. Lorry? <laughs> You're a bachelor in your cradle. Well, that's quite probable too. <laughs> and you were cut out to be a bachelor before you were put in your cradle. Then I think I have been, been very unfairly dealt with and that I ought to be given a voice in the selection of my pattern. What's that? Army! We are lost! Quickly! Follow me! Right to her. A letter? 
describing his having been called away. <laughs> In his current condition? No, no. Pretend he has been called away. Deceive my ladybird. A kind deception. But called away by whom? Called away professionally. I shall, for the first time in my life, absence myself from Telson's. I must stay with him always, reading and writing and so forth. He must see this is a free place. No, personally, you call for me, but I have the pleasure of honouring and associating with your name. Indeed? Yes, indeed. When Dr. Manet was released, you had the charge of him. I know. He was delivered to you. You see, I am informed of the circumstances. Such is the fact, certainly. This was to you that his daughter came, and from your care that she took him to England. Such is the fact. She is lately married. Only lately? Uh, she was pretty enough to have been married long ago. You English are cold, it seems to me. Oh, you know I am English. I perceive your tongue is. Yes, Miss Manette is to be married to one like yourself who is French by birth. The curious thing is the nephew of the Marquis, of whom poor Gaspard was exalted to so great a height. In other words, the present Marquis. He lives unknown in England. Charles Darnay, he calls himself. No. We are grateful for this news of an old acquaintance and naturally happy for our happiness. Another cognac, monsieur? No, no, I must take my leave. I look forward to the pleasure of seeing Monsieur and Madame de Barge again. Can it be true? Since he has said it, it's probably false, but it may be true. If it is? If it is? We have just seen a great reckoning. I hope for her sake that destiny will keep our husband out of France. Our husband's destiny will take him where he is to go and lead him to the end that is to end him. But isn't it strange, after all our sympathy for Dr. Manette and his daughter, that her husband's name should be so proscribed under your hand <coughs> on the side of that accursed spy you just left here? Stranger things than that will happen when it does come. I have them both here at a certainty. And they are both here for their merits, and that is enough. The first day came and went, the fourth, the fifth, five days, six days, seven days, eight days, nine days. The hope ever darkening and the heart always growing heavier and heavier. Mr. Lorry passed through this anxious time. The shoemaker was growing dreadfully skillful, with hands ever more nimble. Expert. Here. Oh, here. Oh, on the floor. Yes. Well, uh, yes. Shall yes. I bring his breakfast now? Yes. Yes, of course, possibly. Ah! Are you quite well? Gone! Dr. Manette! Dead! Cross! He threw himself from the window. What? His poor body! Broken on the stones below. No sign of him. Somebody swept him up. Nonsense. Good morning, Mr. Lorry. Ross. Dr. Manet. Um. I've been downstairs, sir. Is it not time for breakfast? Oh, yes. Breakfast, Ross. What are you thinking of? Oh, well, my blessed Aunt Betsy. Perhaps you stayed the night with us, uh, Mr. Lorry. Did the excitement of the wedding proceed oh, oh, you? Oh, but at the wedding. Exactly. The wedding. Uh, Ross, breakfast in the dining room, as usual. Uh, um, well, uh, what a happy day this is. Happy for a Wednesday, this is. But today is surely so. Uh, no. Wednesday, I assure you, first Wednesday of August. Now, shall we? The first Wednesday in August. Why, yes. Impossible. No, I assure you. But only yesterday. No, ten days ago. How does this happen? My dear friend, Lance. There's been a relapse. Slight 
only slight. Of how long duration? Nine days and nights. How did it manifest itself? In the resumption of an old pursuit. That is the fact. Dreading this. If we could prevent a revival, I'm just, if you had confided in it. Impossible. You've no idea how much we please to say a word upon the subject. But if we knew the cause of the attack. I think that some intense associations of a most distressing nature will vividly recall. Look for the future. Future? My dear Mr. Lorry, I hope and almost believe that the circumstances might be to lead to a repetition of the disorder, but exhausting. So, forgive me being a persistent man of business, but may I ask you one further question? Is it not a pity that you should keep the instruments of your old profession about you? If the tools of your old trade were gone, my dear man, it might not, not some of the old fear go with them. Yes, it is so difficult. They, they were so important to me. I, I would I not keep them. Nothing. They, they do <coughs> no good now. Come. For Lucy's sake. For Lucy's sake, then. Let it be done, dear man. Five days later, in good health and tranquil state of mind, Dr. Annette went away to join Lucy and her husband. That same night, Mr. Lorry went into the doctor's room carrying a hammer. Attended by Miss Cross, carrying a light. There, behind closed doors, in a mysterious and guilty manner, Mr. Lorry smashed the shoemaker's bench to pieces. While Miss Cross held the candle, as if she were assisting at a murder. For which, indeed, in her grimness, she was no unsuitable figure. When the newly married pair came home, First person who arrived to offer his congratulations was Sidney Park. Mr. Lyons, um, I wish for my best. I hope we are all ready, Frank Park. Fashion the speed. No, Mr. Carter. You remember a famous occasion when I was drunk, more drunk than usual. I remember a certain famous occasion where you forced me to confess that you had been drinking. Because of such occasions lies heavy on me, but I always remember them. I wish you would forget them. I forgot it long ago. Shall so speak again, Mr. Darling. Living is not so easy for me, and the life answer does not have me forget it. Have I nothing more important to remember than the great service that you rendered me that day? Mere professional cat trap. You make light of the obligation. Yeah. I will not quarrel with your life answer. I've gone aside for my purpose. I was speaking about not being friends. Yes. Now, you know me, a dissolute dog, never done any good, never will. I don't know that you never will. I do, take my word for it. So if you could endure to have such a worthless fellow coming and going at all times, I should like to ask if I might be permitted. That's a privilege, man. <laughs> and that I should have used the permission. I might avail myself of it four times a year. But it would satisfy me to know I had it. Will you try? Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Done. Then use that in your head. I think so, Carl. By this time. He doesn't care about the world, about himself. He travels on no path, follows no intended direction, and seems incapable of all the higher, better flights of men. Be generous with him, always. He has a heart he very, very seldom reveals, and there are deep wounds in it. But I am sure he is capable of good things, gentle things, even magnanimous things. I shall always remember. A wonderful corner for echoes, that corner where the doctor lived. Ever busily winding the golden thread around her husband, her father, herself, and her old companion in a life of quiet bliss. Lucy sat in the still house in the tranquility resounding corner, listening to the echoing footsteps 
a great city by night. I know every one of the houses encloses its own secrets. Every room in every one of them encloses its own secret. And every heart in the hundreds of thousands is a secret to the heart nearest to it. <coughs> Something in the awfulness of death is referable to this. Death. <coughs> death. The inexorable perpetration of the secrets. Many in the burial places of this city or any of the sleepers more unknowable than its busy inhabitants are to me. Right to them.
stand by me. Gabel, Gabel, my good and faithful friend, I would have been there, would have found a way to come to supervise the change myself. I've been thoughtless, slow to act. Charles? Oh, my love, oh, I've heard such news. My country cries out fire like fire. The innocent are slain for standing in the shadows of the guilty. But you do so much already. We have helped a dozen fugitives, written a thousand letters, sought to protect old friends. Always from a distance. I have acted imperfectly, selfishly. You have been faithful to your family. I know what it has cost. Too little. Thank you, Charles. Do not be tempted back. I could help. Speak for mercy and humanity. Rescue an old friend. I know that if you return to France, I shall never see you again. It is a fine and worthy thing to plunge into the torrent when a man is drowning. Now that to do it with a rescue will die is such a thing as he would be rescued. You cannot throw your life away, Charles de Hollande. Think of your daughter. Think of our life together. Yes, of course. Of course, ma'am. But his resolution was made. He must go to Paris. The lodestone rock was drawing him, and he must stay on until he struck. But he knew of no wrong. He saw hardly any danger. His good intentions to the people, to the reforms on his estate, presented themselves before him in an aspect that would be gratefully acknowledged upon his arrival in France to present them. Urgent business of Towson's bank recalled Mr. Lorry to Paris. It is safe enough for me. Nobody will want to interfere with an old fellow part of one four score when there are uh, so many other far more worth interfering. I have delivered that letter. Will you take a verbal answer? And that I will, I beg It is to a prisoner in the event. His name, Cabell. Say simply, he has received the letter and will come. Uh, any time. Uh, he will start upon his journey tomorrow night. I shall say so. Well, goodbye, my dear fellow. Now, till you see, and till you see, take precious care of them till I get back. That night he sat up late and wrote two letters. One to Lucy, explaining the strong obligation he was under to go to Paris. The other to the doctor, confiding Lucy and their dear child in his care. The next Make sure the fires will you render me a little help. Oh, 
will do nothing for you. My duty is to my country and the people. I am a sworn servant of both against you. I will do nothing for you. What is that, boys? Don't look at me. Manette, for your life, do not look at me. My dear friend, I bear a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is not a patriot in Paris who would touch me except to overwhelm me with embraces or to carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us safely to the barrier, given us news of Charles there, and brought us here. We must know why this distillery, whatever our fear. Yeah! For pity's sake! What is that noise? Don't be afraid. Father's 
laid in jail and kept from them many a time. All our lives we have seen our sister women and their children suffer poverty, neglect, hunger, and misery of all kinds. Judge you! Do you think the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now? Oh, prop, my courage deserts me. Oh, my lady bird, it takes courage to stay so. I'm not unhopeful. That dreadful woman who surpassed a shadow on me and on all my own, like a great, great clown, my pet. No substance in it, but frightful to behold. Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. I was taken to the prisoner of the force, there presented by the crowd who took me to the tribunal. One of the body of Rose identified me. He is the man he says he is. I was greeted with the greatest excitement. I persuaded the tribunal to call for Charles. He was examined. The president conferred with Defarge and said, the, the, the prisoner must remain in custody, but for your sake he shall remain inviolate, in safe custody. Mr. Lorry feared that the scenes of carnage, the anxiety, the horror of the time, would presently revive the old danger in his fate. But he need not have it. My years of desolation were not mere waste of ruin, as my beloved daughter restored me to myself. So I shall restore to her the dearest part of herself. By heaven, I will do it. All things seem to yield before his persevering purpose. He used his influence so wisely that he was soon the respected physician of three prisons, and among them, on the force. He saw Charles Darnay weekly and took sweet messages to Lucy straight from his lips. The Republic of Liberty. Equality, fraternity, or death declared for victory or death against the world in arms. But although the doctor tried hard and never ceased trying to have Charles Darnie set at liberty, or at least to have him brought to trial, the public current of the time had set too strong and fast against him. No cause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest, no measurement of time. The executioner showed the people the head of the king's wife. One year and three months. During all that time, Lucy was never sure from hour to hour, but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. And every day through the stony streets, the tumbrils jolted heavily, filled with the condemned. No cause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest. And then, one morning in December, Charles is summoned for tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yes, there's no time to lose. I'm well prepared. Your time of suspense is at an end. He shall be restored to you. The dread tribunal of judge, public prosecutor, and determined jury sat every day. Charles Everyman, called Darnay, you are accused as an emigrant. Banished on pain of death. Take off his head. Yes, death to you. You are not an emigrant? No, not in the sense accepted by the tribunal. But you married in England? Yes. Who? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who stands there. I have come back to save a citizen's life and to bear his testimony at whatever personal cost to the truth. Is that a crime in the eyes of the Republic? No! no! So far from being a friend of the aristocratic government in England, Charles Darnay has actually been tried for his life by it as the vote of England and the friend of the United States. Yes. Your verdict, citizens? No. Not guilty! Lucy, on my own I am safe. You dearest Charles, thank you. Your father's triumph. No man in France could have done what he has done to me. Don't cry, my dear. Never tremble so. I've saved you. May I ask a question, Dr. Manette? 
I think you may take that liberty. But gracious sake, then talk about liberty. This is quite enough of that talk. Oh, is there any prospect yet of us getting out of this place? I'm afraid not. It would be too dangerous. Oh, then we must have patience and wait. <laughs> What is that? Time to hover. I thought I had to set. My dear, the staircase is as still as death. Father Consul Darnay. I know you, Reverend Mons. I saw you at the tribunal today. You are once again a prisoner of the Republic. No! How does this happen? He is denounced under the section of San Antoine. Who has denounced him? It is against the rule. Who has denounced him? He is denounced and gravely by the citizen and citizeness de Barge and by one other. By what other? Do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes. Then you shall be answered tomorrow. Come. <laughs> on my left, as if I were dead. Five paces by four and a half. Five paces by four and a half. Five paces by four and a half. He made shoes, but lived. And there, in the other room, amongst the ghosts, she was there. She stood. A woman like her, a gleam of candlelight on her head. She looked like. No. Five paces by four and a half. Five paces by four and a half. How could she be there? How could she be there? Barsad is a spy. A spy in the prisons here. Barsad. Barsad. I know that name. The old Bailey, witness of the trial. Good heavens, yes. I hoped I'd never set eyes on you again, sir. I well, wish you had me now. I followed him, listened to his conversation. Darnay has been arrested again. 
What did you tell me? I, I left him safe and free with these two hours. Mr. Barsad took the soldiers to Charles Darnay's door. When was it done, Mr. Barsad? An hour ago. And they were going before the tribunal at Saint Antoine tomorrow. I believe so. But surely, Dr. Manette could arrange for his release. I own to you, I'm shaken that he could not. Perhaps his influence will stand in a good state tomorrow as today. Perhaps. These are desperate times. Desperate games are played for desperate stakes. Let the doctor play the winning game. I will play the losing one. The stake I have chosen to play for is a friend in the prison of the conciergerie. That friend is you, Mr. Barstad. You need a good card, sir. I'll run them over. See what I hold. Mr. Lorry, you know what a brute I am. I wish you could give me a little brandy. Yeah. Mr. Barsad, emissary of Republican committees, now turnkey, now prisoner, who is a spy and secret informer, represents himself to his latest employees under a false name. That's a very good card. Mr. Barsad, now in the employ of the Republican French government, formerly in the employ of the aristocratic English government, the enemy of France and freedom. That's an excellent card. Inference clear as day that Mr. Barsad is a spy of Pitt, an English traitor, an agent of so much mischief spoken of and so difficult to find. It's my card not to be beaten. We've been following my hand, Mr. Barsad. Not to understand your play, sir. I play my ace. Denunciation of Mr. Barsad to the nearest section committee. Now, look over your hand. See what you hold. Yes, it seems to like your hand, Mr. Barsad. I think so. I can appeal to a man of your years of benevolence. Whether it can be that this man can reconcile it to his station of play that age of which he has spoken. Play my age, Mr. Barsad, in a very few minutes without any scruples. You spoke of a proposal. What is it? Now we are all desperate here. I may be not sure if I think it proper. What is it you want? Not much. You're a turnkey at the prison of the conciergerie. I tell you, there is no such thing as escape possible. Why do you need to tell me what I do not ask? You are a turnkey. I am sometimes. You can do when you choose. I can pass in and out when I choose. Very well. You will take me to see our prisoner when the time is right. It could be done. It must be. Will be then. Very well. We shall meet tomorrow evening after the tribunal. There will be more details to explain. Now. All right, Mr. Barsan. Thank you. But access to him will not free him. I never said it would. You are a good man and a true friend. Forgive me if I notice you are affected. I could not see my father weep and sit by careless, and I could not respect your sorrow more if you were my father. Well, you're free from that misfortune, however. If you do not tell Lucy of this arrangement with Mr. Barsad, it would not help her to go see poor Darnay. I cannot help her, and I shall not see her. I'll help her in my own way. How does she look? Anxious. Unhappy. Oh, begging beautiful. It's time. Have your duties here come to an end? Uh, yes, yes, I, I have my leave to pass. I was ready to go. Yours is a long life to look back on, isn't it? I am in my 78th year. You for all your life, steadily occupied, trusted, respected. I have been a man of business ever since I was a man. Indeed, I may say I was a man of business when I was a boy. See what a place you fill at 78. How many people will miss you? You leave it empty. A solitary old bachelor? Nobody will weep for me. How can you say that? Wouldn't she weep for you? Wouldn't her child weep for you? Yes. Of course. I didn't quite mean what I said. Is it things to thank God for, sir? Is it not? 
チリショウチリショウ
Ernest de Fars, wine vendor of Saint Antoine. Good. Thérèse de Fars, his wife. Good. Alexander Magnet, physician. Who and where is the whole conspirator who dares to say that I did not the husband of thy child? Citizen Magnet, be tranquil. See what is the foil. Be silent. Citizen de Fars. And you did good service that day at the Bastille, citizen. So they say. Inform the tribunal of what happened that day within the Bastille. I knew that this doctor I used to serve had been confined in a cell known as 105 North Tower. I mounted to the cell to search it. Concealed there, I find a written paper. This is that written paper. It is the writing of Dr. Manette. What does it say, citizen? It tells how the prisoner's father and his uncle took the doctor here to see a girl, a peasant girl, abducted by the prisoner's father, violated by the prisoner's father, oh. robbed of her reason by the prisoner's father. Oh. It tells of her father's death and of her husband's. Her father broken by shame and grief. Oh. Her husband sacrificed when he refused the prisoner's father his indulgence with the girl. It tells of her brother murdered when he tried to rescue the girl. Oh. It tells of her death and how they loved to be rid of her. Oh. It tells how the doctor had seen and heard too much and how they brought him to his living grave. Oh. It ends these men and their descendants to the last of their race. I, Alexander Manette, unhappy prisoner, do this night in my unbearable agony denounce to the time when all things shall be answered. I denounce them to heaven and to earth. Oh. I strike my bosom with these two hands and I tell you, citizen, that peasant family so injured by the two Evermore brothers was my family. That sister of the murdered boy was my sister. That husband was my sister's husband. That brother was my brother. That father <coughs> was my father. <coughs> those dead are my dead. And that summons to answer for those things descends to me. Guilty! 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 Unanimously voted, at heart and by descent, a, a traitor to the people, an aristocrat, an enemy of the revolution. Take him from here to his prison. The sentence will be death, death, or death.
got to Manette. Take her home, look after her, but do not record her to herself. She is better so. Mr. Lorry, the word. Oh, he's lost. He will perish! They are in great danger. They're in danger of denunciation by Madame Tufage. I have heard words of that woman before the tribunal. She plans the denunciation within a week and protects it with the usual one, a prison plot. You don't look so horrified. You will save them all. Heaven grant I may, Carlson. But how? If you have money, you can buy means of travel to the sea coast as fast as the journey can be made. Yes, and have your horses ready in starting trim by nine o'clock in the morning. Now, for the sake of her father and her child, press her for the necessity of leaving Paris with them and you at that hour. Now, wait for me to come to you. The moment I arrive, take me in and drive away. I understand. I wait for you under all circumstances. Wait for nothing but for my place to be occupied, and then for England. Then I understand that I shall not be one old man. I shall have a young and ardent man by my side. God willing, I do too. And I promise me not to change the detail of this plan. I promise, and I pray to God, I pray to God, I pray to I do too. Good night. Goodbye, dear Mr. Carlton, until the morning. Mr. Barsad, the work. In the black prison of concierge, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. Charles Darnay, alone in his cell, fully comprehended that no personal influence could possibly save him. And it was not easy, the face of his beloved wife fresh before him, to compose his mind for what it must bear. His hold on life was strong and very, very hard to loosen. By gradual degrees and efforts, it loosened the little there. He clenched the tighter there. And when he came to bear his strength on that fist, and it yielded, this was closed again. He wrote a long letter to Lucy, another to her father, a third to Mr. Lorry, explaining, encouraging, consoling, entreating. He never once thought of Carton. His mind was so full of the others, but he never once thought of him. Nine o'clock in the somber morning. God forever. Ten <coughs> is the final hour. There is but another now. He had never seen the instrument that was to terminate his life. How high will it be? How many steps? Where shall I be stood? How touched? Will their hands be red? Which way shall they turn my face? Will I be first or last? Do you know I wait here? Lose no time. All the people on earth, you least expected to see me. I cannot believe it to be you. You are not a prisoner. No, I have some power over another keeper's here. I bring a request from her. Your wife, dear Darnay. Oh, what is it? The most earnest, pressing, and emphatic entreaty. You must comply with it. And take off your coat and put on this of mine. Uh, there is no escape in this place. It is impossible. Please, Darnay, take off your coat. It can never be done. Do it's madness. Have I asked you to pass through that door? If I ask that, refuse. Now, please, Darnay, hurry. Is there pen and ink? Uh, yes. Was your hand steady enough to write? Yes. Okay, now sit. Write what I dictate. Um, to whom do I address it? To no one. Just listen and write. Do you remember the words passed between us long ago? You will readily comprehend this when you read it. You do remember them. It is not in your nature to forget them. Have you really forget them? I have. You stand a weapon in your hand. No, no, I'm not armed. Oh, what is it in your hand? You shall know readily. Please, Donnie, write on there. But a few more words. I am thankful that the time has come. And I can honour them. That I do so is of no cause for regret or grief. What vapour is that? Vapour? Something, something that crossed me. I'm conscious of nothing. Please, darling, value your attention. Hurry, please. I, I feel suddenly faint. Please, darling, hurry. Yes. 
just it had been otherwise it had been otherwise Traitor to the people! Yeah. 
Thank <laughs> you. 